Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to a master series lecture in the Peristyle. And we're delighted uh, that this series uh, is being sponsored by our Toledo Museum of Art ambassadors. So all you ambassadors take a bow and everybody might like to express appreciation to our ambassadors. As you all know, uh, this past weekend, the exhibition Manet Portraying Life opened in our Canada galleries here at the Toledo Museum of Art. We're thrilled to have such a magnificent exhibition in Toledo. We're most grateful to our lenders. We're most grateful to our sponsors, uh, Block Communications, BP, uh, Brooks Insurance, Healthcare REIT, and Taylor Cadillac. I'm especially grateful to Larry Nichols, who has done such a wonderful job in curating this marvelous show. And he would want to, me to say to you, to ask you each and every one a favor, which is to make sure that you invite every relative you have, <laughs> every friend you have, uh, to visit Mane Portraying Life before it closes on January the 1st, 2013. Visit early, visit often. Tonight, we're very fortunate to have with us Gary Tintero, who assumed the position of director of the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston earlier this year. Previously, Gary had served over 28 years at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. He left his position as Engelhardt Chairman of 19th century modern and contemporary art at the Metropolitan Museum to move to Houston, uh, to his native Texas. He took his undergraduate degree from Brandeis University and studied art history and museum studies at Harvard University. Now, Gary's talents are very broad. He's looked after exhibitions on the rooftop of the Metropolitan Museum that you will have seen, exhibitions of modern and contemporary art, but he is especially known as a specialist in 19th century French art. He's organized many exhibitions, among them wonderful exhibitions right back to the 1980s, 1988, an exhibition of the work of Degas. In 1993, the Habermeyer Collection, the Splendid Legacy, it was called. The groundbreaking exhibition, Origins of Impressionism, in 1994, and the exquisite portraits by Ang in 1999. More recently, Cézanne to Picasso, Ambroise Vollard, the patron of the avant-garde in 2006, and the truly memorable exhibition, Francis Bacon, in 2008. Most recently, uh, Picasso in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now, Gary has delved deeply into the work of Manet, and uh, notably in his superb show, Manet Velasquez, the French taste for Spanish painting, which was voted by the New York Times as the best historical art exhibition of its year. Larry will take questions for Gary at the end and invite those from you and thank Gary. But I want you to welcome him as he addresses this Spanish aspect of Manet's career. Manet's interest in and dependence on Spanish art. Gary is much loved by France. He is not only an officer of the Ordre des Arts et des Lettres, but also a chevalier of the Légion d'Honneur. He was the founding president of the Association of Art Museum Curators. He is truly a distinguished curator who is now, I'm sure, going to be a truly great director. Welcome, a warm to lead a welcome to Gary Tintero. Uh, 
brought to you here in Toledo. I know because I was on the other end of uh, his negotiating uh, prowess when I, in my role at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, where I was trying to keep a few paintings back uh, for the six million visitors a year in, in New York. But he did pry a few loose from those august walls. Uh, he's, it's hard to say no to Larry. And um, it's above all because of his, I think, scholarly approach to his material, but his real love for his position here in Toledo, and his desire, his desire to bring the very best that he can to you, his much-loved public. Well, he asked me, and Brian did as well, um, if I could come speak to you about my experience organizing an exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and uh, at the um, Musée d'Orsay in Paris in 2002-2003. It was a phenomenal adventure to work on that exhibition, and it started with a very simple question. Why did Manet want to emulate the work of a Spanish master, quite specifically Velazquez, in the late 1850s and early 1860s, under the Second Empire of France. And as I began to answer that question for myself, and the question was naturally posed to me because I was the keeper of a great collection of Manet's paintings at the Met, uh, some 30 works, I believe, but many of his great full-length figure paintings in the Spanish style are there at the museum. So it was naturally for anyone going through those galleries, and especially somebody responsible for those pictures, would continually ask the question, why Spain, why Velazquez, why in Second Empire France? And as it began to delve into the answer uh, superficially, I began to find startling information, like at the time that Manet was painting like Velazquez, there were no real Velazquez in, in, in France at this time. And then as I began to understand historically the relationship of France and French connoisseurs and French artists to Spanish painting, I realized there was a fascinating story there that has to do with the French conquest of the Iberian uh, Peninsula, the disestablishment of the great monasteries, convents, and churches up by uh, Napoleon's generals uh, during the War of Occupation in Spain, 1808 to, to 1810 that there were fascinating dramas of uh, war loot, restitution, semi-legal purchases, uh, a kind of parting gift to a king that had just been dethroned. All of this was essential for establishing the French taste for Spanish painting, which ultimately brings us paintings like this by Edward Manet when he was a young man painting in France in the 1860s. Uh, as you can see in the exhibition and um, as you can read in the catalog, uh, the painting here on the left, Rouvière as the, as the actor uh, Hamlet, was painted after Manet went to Spain in 1865. But in fact, most of the pictures by Manet I'm going to show you today were painted before his trip. And while there were very few paintings by Spanish masters in France, but there was the memory of Spanish painting. And it was this memory which was essential uh, to captivating the French imagination. And so if we look from the period from 1800 and the rise of Napoleon, 1808, the capture of, uh, the Span of the Iberian Peninsula by France, so from the early 1800s till 1850, what we see is this fascinating shift in a paradigm away from idealism, in French painting to realism, from a Renaissance ideal uh, typified by Raphael, Leonardo, to a Baroque ideal typified by the Spanish masters like Velazquez or Zuberon or Rivera, <coughs> from porcelain-like finishes, which the French called leche or licked surfaces, to a brushy, elusive, and optical uh, kind of painting. So how, in fact, did that happen? The very first Spanish Baroque paintings to arrive in France probably came in the suitcases of a young Spanish princess, uh, Maria Teresa, who was sent, she was the daughter of Philip IV, who was the great patron of Velazquez. Um, she was, his daughter was sent to, fr to France to marry Louis XIV, the French king, in order to forge an alliance between 
France and Spain, and indeed that marriage did. And she brought with her crates full of paintings. It was kind of like her Facebook wall, which she brought to her retiring room. It was called her salle de bain, her bathroom, but it was really like her private cabinet at the Louvre, where she had a frieze of some 50 portraits painted by Velazquez in his school of all the people she had left behind in Spain. This is one of the few paintings that remain from that frieze, and it showed up in a flea market after the French Revolution and was bought by the curator of the Louvre, where it's been ever since. Never underestimate the power of the flea market. A <laughs> hundred years later, a court minister named Biarderie d'Angevillier, I practiced that five times before I came out on the stage tonight, Biarderie d'Angevillier, he was a minister for <coughs> Louis XVI, and he wanted to create in the Grand Gallery of the Musée du Louvre, which was simply a, pass, a corridor, like that corridor that passes in Florence from uh, the Uffizi over to the PT Palace. It was a corridor connecting the ancient castle of the Louvre with the more modern uh, chateau of the Tuileries. Um, wanted to take that space, which had been used for military and naval models, and war, wars were planned there, and turn it into a museum of fine arts. And so <clears throat> as he began to bring together all the royal holdings and collections, which were in fact quite spotty, Biardery d'Angevillier realized that there were no Spanish paintings uh, to be shown in this future museum, which he thought would instruct generations of French painters. And he, above all, wanted to acquire some uh, Spanish painting because um, there was a big uh, bubble in the market for Spanish painting caused in the 18th century by Spanish sherry traders and wine merchants working out of Seville uh, who had a love for these uh, peasant paintings by Murillo, these genre scenes. Uh, delightful pictures of young ragamuffins, uh, the, plea, the flea picker on the left, on the right, the young boy with a basket of um, chestnuts and his dog, which became so important for 18th century Britain when painters like Gainsborough and Reynolds would emulate them in their own genre painting in the 18th century. Well, the French were always looking over their shoulder at the British, and when the British valued Murillo, so too did the French want to buy them. And in fact, he was successful in buying for the royal collections these two paintings. Uh, well, the painting on the left, um, uh, the one on the right got away and went to Catherine the Great of Russia, who was forming the most important collection of European painting at the end of the 18th century. And Biarri, Donchevier, the French kings, Napoleon later, were up against uh, the, the financial might of the Russian court. But already, Biarri d'Angevillier was having dealings with a fellow named Le Brun, a very savvy art dealer who married uh, the, uh, the wonderful painter Elizabeth Vigée. She was called Vigée Le Brun. And he started to, to deal in Spanish paintings and looking for them wherever he could, either in Spain or in Italy. Because remember, the, the Spa Spain owned southern Italy, Naples and the two Sicilies. There were a lot of Spanish paintings there uh, as well. And so this beautiful Rivera, now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, was one of the pictures that LeBron picked up and began to sell. Sold it several times in the early 1800s in France. The only other two important Spanish paintings in France prior to 1800 were these two works, which also surfaced during the French Revolution. And their earlier whereabouts were simply unknown. This extraordinary Velazquez on the left, which is the, um, the philosopher Democritus, which appeared magically in Rouen. And then on the right, a painting which appeared also in a flea market in, in Lyon, uh, the <coughs> extraordinary St. Francis by Zubaran. It's more likely that the Zubaran had been a royal diplomatic gift, perhaps by this Spanish princess, had it sent to a convent in Lyon. Um, you know, there was some relationship that she might have had with this convent whereby such an important gift would have been transmitted. But how this great Velasquez got to Rouen, 
nobody has been able to determine yet. And it shows you on the left, I mean, these two paintings typify 17th century, the two poles of 17th century Spanish painting. On the left, the use of everyday models, sort of man picked off the street and placed in the role of a sevel. Here, a great philosopher, the Greek philosopher, philosopher Democritus. Or on the right, the intense spirituality of Spanish painting. So here you have that duality, spirituality and extraordinary realism, both expressed by two masters of the 17th century. This fellow, Biardoui d'Angervilliers, I think it's the last time I'm going to say his name tonight, um, <clears throat> already sent a letter to, and the letter is preserved, to the French ambassador to Madrid, uh, saying that I know there must be paintings by the great masters lost and forgotten in the attics of Spain, which the dealers have yet to explore. It occurred to me that one ought to make the rounds and see what you can send back to Paris. Well, it was just because of avaricious people like him and sort of double-dealing French ambassadors that uh, the Spanish court passed a decree, a decree uh, in 1789 that no paintings by Spanish masters shall leave Spanish territory. 1789, and the rest of the paintings I'm going to show you today are paintings that left the Spanish territory after 1789. <laughs> so it was a, a functionless decree. They were unable to police their borders. And an important actor in this regard was the French ambassador Guy Mardet, who was sent by the director, directorate. <clears throat> he was a friend of Napoleon's, and one of the first things he did, he was an art lover, and one of the first things he did was commission his portrait by Goya, left, who called this painting the best thing that he had ever done. And it was on, he also bought this small painting of a lady dressed in the, in, in the guise of a maha, a woman in fanciful street clothes uh, with uh, the mantilla and the elaborate um, embroidered dress. And he did two important things. He allowed Goya to print the caprichos on the printing press in the, Spanish, in the French embassy in Madrid because these works were too controversial, possibly seditious, and certainly critical of the Spanish Catholic Church. And so they were printed, in a sense, under the freedom of the French embassy press. And he brought these two paintings and a set of those caprichos, at least one set, back to France and shared them with his nephew, and his godson, and his godson was Eugène Delacroix, the great master of French Romanticism. And it was this very direct transmission of knowledge of Goya's paintings, which uh, Delacroix could see in his godfather's house, and access to an album of Goya's Caprichos, which um, if you know Delacroix's prints, like his illustrations for Faust of the 1820s, you see they come right out of Goya's imagery, where did he see them? He saw them at his godfather's house, probably the only set in France uh, at this time. That um, Spanish princess who married uh, Marie Antoinette uh, did her duty. Uh, she had um, a daughter, Joanna, uh, who had a son who became uh, the king of Spain in 1700. Those of you who know your history know that uh, toward the end of Louis XIV's reign and after the death of a, the death of a Habsburg uh, monarch in Spain, there was a question as to who was going to be. There were several contenders for the next king of Spain. There was the Habsburg line, and then there was a Bourbon contender who was a grandson of, um, great-grandson of Philip IV of Spain. And uh, Louis XIV, through the war of Spanish success and succession, imposed his grandson um, as the first Bourbon king of Spain in 1700. And so the alliance continued between France and Spain, and that was true all through the 18th century, where S Spain was France's ally principally against England. England was always the bugaboo, the bugbear for uh, France in the 18th century. It was always pitting itself and measuring itself against uh, England. And Spain, which was very rich country was France's ally. And so it's no surprise that uh, King Charles IV, who was the Goya king, 
I should commission for the great reception room at the Royal Palace of the Buen Retiro in Madrid, which was lined with paintings by Velázquez and later Goya of the kings of Spain mounted um, on their horses, that they should commission from Jacques-Louis David a portrait of their great friend and ally, Napoleon, Emperor of the French, crossing the Pyrenees, uh, cross, excuse me, crossing the Alps, uh, to hang in that room. What a fateful commission that was, because Napoleon, of course, was not content just to cross the Alps. Pretty soon, he was crossing the Pyrenees. And this is what happened. He finally, although there were a number of treaties with uh, Spain, and in, f and in fact, they were always to France's advantage and to Spain's disadvantage. Uh, for example, uh, one, they were negotiated by Napoleon's brother, Lucien, who was himself a, a greedy collector and a great aficionado of Spanish painting. He wrote his brother, Napoleon, for the Treaty of Tuscany, <coughs> which is where I believe uh, Spain ceded Louisiana to France, as well as some islands in the Caribbean. I got 20 good paintings from the gallery of the Buen Retiro for my personal gallery, and they are also mounting 100,000 acres of diamonds for me. I'll get the same for the piece of Portugal in which more territory was being um, transmitted to France. Don't worry, he says to his brother, I will conceal nothing from you upon my return. Uh, so after they've taken paintings that they wanted, after they take all these diamonds, after they take the Louisiana, for example, and then flip it and sell it to the United States of America, um, they kept the Caribbean islands because those were essential for the sugar and, and slave trade. They then just go ahead and invade Spain on the pretext of uh, uh, quelling unrest in Portugal. The Portuguese monarchs had fled uh, west, going to Brazil, and uh, the French occupied the entire I Iberian Peninsula. It was not easy, and over four years of struggle, the French lost 200,000 soldiers, and 300,000 Spaniards died. It was a very bloody revolt. And Goya captured the imagery of the Dos and Tres del Mayo, the days of the Spanish revolt and resistance, in these two paintings. But the French won, and Napoleon installed his brother, Joseph, on the throne. When, once they got to Madrid, and literally there was a ceremony whereby Napoleon handed him the king, uh, handed his brother Joseph um, uh, the, the Spanish crown. The French army descended into Seville, and uh, a famous marshal named uh, Marshal Soult, S-O-U-L-T, um, quelled and captured Seville. The uh, fathers of Seville did not want the city destroyed by the French, and so they handed him the keys to the city, asking for peace. Uh, the first thing he did was go into all the convents, monasteries, and churches and round up the nice round number of 1,000 paintings, which were brought into the Alcazar, the, the ancient uh, sort of city hall and fortress in the city of Seville, and began to catalog these paintings with the help of that wily dealer, Monsieur Lebrun, as well as a couple of other um, soldiers who became uh, famous chroniclers of Spanish painting later in the 19th century. And then, Maria de, uh, then General Soult decided to take for himself about 150 paintings uh, for his personal collection. Uh, some of them were so large, like these 12-foot wide Murillos, that they could not eventually be housed in his uh, gallery eventually in Paris, and so they were sent immediately to the Louvre. But other paintings he did take home to Paris in 1810, like this great Rivera, Rivera uh, the martyrdom on the left of Saint Sebastian, and on the right, the, uh, the mother of all Spanish paintings, uh, Murillo's Immaculate Conception of 1678. And this hung in a place of glory in his stairway at, on the Rue de l'Université, where he lived comfortably from 1810 uh, till his death in the early 1850s, although he left his master, uh, the French King Joseph, uh, on a very unstable throne in Madrid, and eventually Joseph had to 
retreat and was captured by the British. As he was retreating from Madrid, uh, the, the British took uh, all the, some 50 carriages uh, with crates on them that were leaving Madrid and heading toward France. And the, uh, the British at the Battle of Vittoria uh, captured all this loot. And among the paintings that you see here are two works by Velasquez, uh, one on the left in the Wallace Collection in London and the one on the right in Apsley House. It's fascinating to think how they got to uh, London. Once the British were able to restore the Spanish crown, the crown to the uh, Spanish legitimate heir, Ferdinand VII, uh, in recognition to uh, the British Lord Wellington, who had delivered Spain back to the royal family, he let him keep all the paintings that he had captured from the fleeing Joseph Bonaparte. And that's how these great Spanish paintings got to London. A few pictures did make it to the Louvre. Within two weeks of Napoleon handing the crown uh, to his brother Joseph to reign in Madrid, the curator of the Louvre, Vivant de Nantes, arrived to start making his selections for the Musée de Louvre. And here you see the wedding procession of uh, the Emperor Napoleon when he was marrying his second wife. And uh, uh, they were here, there, passing by all the great Raphaels, which had been looted from the Vatican and other museums uh, and um, the churches in Italy. There were a bay of Spanish paintings, and uh, those paintings immediately uh, piqued the interest of the, uh, of the French painters working in France at this time. So here you have, on the left, a crucifixion by Pierre-Paul Proudhon, and on the right, Francois Gérard, Gérard and Proudhon both being court painters for Josephine and Napoleon uh, during the empire, who usually worked in a very precise academic style. Uh, Proudhon often looking at uh, Leonardo for inspiration, and Gérard looking uh, at the polished perfection of Florentine Renaissance painting as typified by Raphael. But when the Spanish paintings finally arrived in the Louvre for a brief time before the fall of Napoleon in 1814, immediately we see the reflection of their presence in Paris in the work of the French masters. But the mother load of paintings were in Marshal Soult's house in 18, uh, starting from 1810 until his death in 1850. And there he welcomed artists. So on the one hand, if you go to the museum inventories, you're studying what was going on in Paris in the 19th century, you see that there are very few Spanish paintings at the Louvre. But just around the corner on the Rue Université were 150 glorious paintings that had been taken from Seville by, Mar by Marshal Soult. And so on the, on the right, you see an Alonso Cano that was taken from Seville. And on the left, you see a copy of that painting by Eugène Delacroix. And this is where the generation of French romantic painters learned about something other than northern painting or Italian painting. This is where the Spanish school, for the first time, was revealed to young French artists. So when Delacroix was invited by the mayor of Paris to make an altarpiece for a church, he supplied a painting on the left that was deeply inspired by this great Murillo on the right, which he knew from Marshal Soult's house. When the British finally restored the throne to the, the Spanish Bourbon kings, all those paintings that had been in religious institutions and in the royal collection had been removed from their original place and inventoried by the French. And one of the first things that Joseph Bonaparte wanted to do in a typically French encyclopedic manner was to establish a museum, just like there was in Paris. Well, Madrid has great paintings, or Spain has a great school. Let's make a museum. Well, that, and Joseph tried several times to make that museum. It wasn't made until after the French were kicked out Spanish came back, Spanish monarchs, and in a museum of natural history, 
on the Paseo del Prado was created for the first time a public museum called the Museo del Prado, where for the first time someone who was not, who did not have access to a religious institution or praying in the Catholic Church or access to the royal palace could see Spanish painting in all of its glory. So this is the important thing to understand about Spanish painting. It was locked up. It was made for convents, for monasteries, some of it altarpieces for churches which were ex accessible to, to tourists, or the royal palace which very few people uh, could, could enter. But from 1819 on, one could see rooms like you see here photographed in the mid-19th century where the great Spanish paintings by Velázquez, Zubran, Murillo, Ribera could be visible. So you'll recognize <coughs> some of the famous paintings. Here, I think I have a pointer. If you know your Velázquez, here's Philip IV as a hunter, uh, right here. Here's the famous Ianderas the Spinners by Velasquez. And uh, here later, after it was returned by the French, is this great uh, Maria of the Dream of the Patrician that Marshal Soult had taken uh, to Paris. It wouldn't fit in his house. It was at the Louvre. And so as a result, it was returned to um, Spain. But it was so interesting, very much like World War II reparations, when the Allies, and there were many Allies, the Austrians, the Swedes, the, and the Prussians, all the different principalities of, of, of um, Germany uh, contributed, the Italians, to uh, unseat Napoleon. They occupied Paris, <coughs> and the first thing they did was set up a war loot restitution council, and all the paintings that had been taken by the French that were held in government facilities were returned to the, to the, to, from whence they came either to the Vatican or to the churches in Flanders or in Germany or to uh, the Spanish crown. But those that were in private houses were not subject to restitution. So Marshal Sewell's 150 paintings were, he was able to keep until his death in the early 1850s. However, these two paintings that were too big for his house were at the Louvre and therefore they were sent back. In, uh, once the British restored the monarchy. Uh, it was a very unstable and rocky road. And then there were a number of smaller and then ultimately larger revolutions in Spain in the 19th century. At one point in 1823, the French tried to quell a rebellion and to support their Bourbon cousins uh, in, in Madrid. And so Louis XVIII <coughs> sent, as he called, the 100,000 sons of San Luis, they saw me of Fils de San Luis, to Spain in order to quell a rebellion and to uh, sustain and uphold uh, a very rocky monarchy. And uh, it was during, the, during that campaign that many of these soldiers would spend their off days in the Museo del Prado and develop a love for Spanish paintings. And some of these became very famous actors in the culture of France, like Prosper Merime, Victor Hugo, Théophile Gautier, Baron Taylor. So in their teens and early 20s, they were sent to Madrid, and they developed a love for Spanish culture and for Spanish painting. One of them, Baron Taylor, was later hired in the early 1830s to work for the new French king, Louis-Philippe, and he gave him a million francs, and with that money he bought 400 paintings for a Spanish gallery to be held at the Louvre. So Napoleon tried to steal paintings through the agency of his brother, through the agency of his curator, Vivant de Nantes, from Madrid, and have a Spanish gallery. Brief, for a brief moment it existed, and then it was returned after uh, 1814 and the, and the fall of Napoleon. This time, Louis Philippe, the king of France, is going to buy paintings with his million francs. Now remember that 1789 decree, no Spanish paintings shall leave Spanish territory. It was still in effect, and it was reinforced by 
and, and, and reissued by uh, Joseph Bonaparte and again by Ferdinand VII. Nevertheless, with this money and with the help of a French man of war waiting in the port of Seville, he was able to export some 400 paintings. And I'll show you some of them. That great Murillo portrait, now at the Met. Uh, this uh, great Greco crucifixion, now at the Louvre. The so-called daughter of El Greco, now attributed to Sophonisba uh, Anguissola. Uh, perhaps the Infanta Caterina Michaela, a late, 17th, a late 16th century a beautiful portrait. As well as these extraordinary Goyas, uh, the one on the left called Ketal, What's Happening Man? And on the right, uh, the great uh, portrait of the Machas on the balcony. Uh, this is the version um, that is now at the Metropolitan Museum. There were, uh, the, those paintings were purchased from 1835 to 1838, and they were displayed at the Louvre from 1838 to 1848, just 10 years, in the Galerie Espagnole. But it was a phenomenal event and once again, we can see an immediate reaction in the work of French painters. So someone like Jean-Francois Millet, and there are beautiful etchings on view here in your museum by Millet, the, the great Barbizon master. Here's his version on the left of the painting by Luca Giordano on the right. It was thought at the time to be Spanish and by Rivera. In fact, it's by uh, his student, Luca Giordano, who worked in Naples. Or here on the left, Camille Corot, another Barbizon master, who is looking at uh, the great Zuberon St. Francis, which is now at the National Gallery in London. <coughs> the Spanish Museum, or the Gallery Espanol, Baudelaire wrote in 1846, had the effect of increasing the volume of general ideas that you had to have about art. A museum of foreign art is an international place of fellowship where two peoples, observing and studying each other in a more relaxed fashion, come to know each other and fraternize without arguing. Another, uh, Théophile Gautier, the great poet and writer, wrote, the Romantic school made Spain fashionable again, with Victor Hugo's Les Orientales, Alfred de Musset's Tales, and Prosper Merimé's novellas, including his Théâtre de Clara Gazul, and of course, his story Carmen, which became the opera. And it was the memory of that Gallery Espanol that Edward Manet is relating to in the late 1850s and 80s. It closes in 1848 because uh, Louis Philippe loses his throne. He goes into exile in England. And with him, he takes these 400 paintings. It was not clear whether it, those, those, that million francs came from his personal purse or whether from the public treasury. But the uh, French uh, government who succeeded him in 1848, uh, had him sign a contract whereby if he takes these paintings with him, he agrees not to return to France and not to, you know, to, to foment another revolution to try to regain the throne. So this is what the French call a cadeau de rupture, these 400 paintings that went to, um, went into England in 1848. He died a few years later and, and sales in 1853. These 400 paintings were sold in auction in Christie's in London and were then distributed around the world from Budapest to Boston. And that's how Spanish painting got distributed for the first time ever outside of France, Spain, and a few diplomatic gifts uh, either to Flanders or to, to Vienna or to uh, Naples where this where the, where the Habsburgs had properties. And again, that memory of the Galerie Espagnole, uh, it was where uh, many French artists cut their teeth, uh, such as Chasserio on the left, or Millet here on the right. And Courbet, in the late 1840s, is responding dramatically to the presence of Spanish Baroque painting in the Gallery Espanol. So here are some of his paintings from the late 1840s, self-portraits of himself as a sculptor on the left and on the right uh, as a, a cellist uh, playing with his wrong hands, looking in a mirror. Uh, he, he didn't know how to play the cello, as we can see in this painting. 
or in these extraordinary uh, paintings which he made, uh, now both of them at the Musée d'Orsay, uh, the painting above called uh, the, st the Studio of the Painter, a real allegory of seven years of my life, and at the bottom, the burial at Ornon, showing uh, a, a, a peasant uh, funeral procession, but um, uh, organized in the, in the way that Velasquez organized his great uh, reconciliations or battle scenes where the two sides were coming together uh, to sue for peace. On the left, you see uh, Velasquez's famous Las Meninas, and on the right, Courbet's uh, studio of the painter. And you see the idea, I mean, the format, of course, is very different, but the idea of a painter painting, because indeed, if you don't know the painting, Velasquez is seen here. He's working <coughs> on this large painting. He probably is doing a portrait of the king and queen who are standing in front of him, but whom we see reflected in the mirror in the background. And, and, and what this great painting shows is the painter painting the king and queen, interrupted by a visit of the princess with her dwarfs, with her German shepherd, and with her ladies-in-waiting. Similarly, we have Courbet interrupted, painting a landscape, while a conveniently nude model looks adoringly over his shoulder, uh, interrupted by all of his supporters here, or on this side, uh, typical French types. And this, of course, painting is a great painting with uh, many layers of meaning, but there are also, you know, we have Baudelaire over here, and we have a caricature of the emperor over here as a beggar. So it was with the precedence of Courbet's very important paintings that he was showing in the salons of the 1840s, in the style of Spanish realism, that Manet hits the scene for the first time in the Salon of 1859, showing this bizarre painting called The Absinthe Drinker, where he shows a drunkard, drunkard with his glass, glass of absinthe, which was that highly addictive wormwood distillate, his other bottle of gin or something thrown there on the street, uh, wearing his right shoe on his left foot. <laughs> but like a Velasquez philosopher, a simple man, a street urchin, a, a, a homeless person, cast in the guise of someone who knows more about reality, human life, and wisdom uh, than the educated Seville. So the very notion of showing the beggar as if he were an important person, this is a strategy adopted from Velazquez, but of course, Manet has not seen Velazquez, except he may have visited the Gallery Espanol before it closed in 1848. He would have been 14 years old. <coughs> it's just possible that he did, but he certainly saw photographs of the gallery. There were etchings and books on Spanish painting that were available to him. But it was the prestige of the Spanish gallery and the use of the Spanish gallery for motifs by painters like Corot and Chasserio and Millet and above all Courbet that incited Manet to adopt the same style. And my, my feeling is, is that it was the loss of the Gallery Espanol in 1848 which became an issue of national shame that became an even stronger incentive for artists like Courbet and Manet to restitute this loss. We no longer have Spanish painting, so we will paint like Spaniards so that we can look at art of this kind. That, that first painting, the absinthe drinker, was, was uh, ridiculed in the salon. People had never heard of Manet, didn't know who he was, why he was painting. Uh, like Velasquez, few people actually recognize the source of his picture. But he still was uh, infatuated with Spain, and so the next year in the Salon of 1860, he exhibited this work, now at the Met, the young Spanish singer, looking more at Murillo's uh, young beggars, typical of the kinds of paintings that were still at the Louvre that had been bought by, repeat after me, Biarderie d'Angervilliers. And so here, looking at Murillo, with a wonderful little Spanish still life in the foreground, uh, thinking as well as uh, of, of, of Goya, uh, that he tries a second go 
at having a success at the Salon with a Spanish-inspired painting, and he did. It was at this time that critics were writing about Courbet, perhaps by rehabilitating the modern, and with excellent working methods that overlie his representation of the modern. Courbet will, will facilitate the arrival of a noble and great Velasquez, a mocking and satirical Goya. And I think it's possible that reading criticism like that, that Manet said to himself, well, I'm going to try to be the noble and great Velasquez. I'm going to try to be the satirical Goya that these critics are calling for. And to remind you, at the very same Salon of 1860, where Goya's, excuse me, uh, Manet's Spanish singer was on view, so too was this painting by Ancre. It was the last redoubt of Raphaelism. And as far as Ancre and his disciples were concerned, this is what beauty is. This is how painters should paint. And this is, and, and by now I would think that this, this slide to you would be surprising if not shocking. Uh, the clarity of the color, the, the absurdity of the situation, uh, the, the lack of any kind of convincing realism in the execution uh, of the representation of this scene. Uh, Christ uh, uh, teaching the disciples. There's nothing realistic or convincing about this picture. It's, it lives in the, in the world of ideas or in the world of faith, but not in the world of, of, of reality, of, of, of an earthly reality. And this, to me, typifies how far France has come away from this kind of painting, which had been held as the ideal only 50 years before, to a new ideal, which is Spanish realism, even though there are, at this point, very few Spanish paintings left in France. Well, the impact of Courbet and then Manet had immediate repercussions in the artists who were attracted to Courbet and now Manet as leaders of the new school, of the new painting, La Nouvelle Peinture. So Edgar Degas, who became a good friend of Manet, and I'll show you how they met in a moment in the Louvre in 1862, begins to look over his shoulder at Manet and Courbet and begins to adopt his own kind of hispanism in his work, such as this beautiful portrait of his father on the far right listening to the Spanish singer Pagans. Because it wasn't just Spanish painting that the French loved at this time. It was all of Spanish culture. And there were troops of dancers, ballet dancers, the, um, the great opera by Bizet. Carmen was written at this time for the Paris opera. Offenbach had Spanish-inspired uh, themes as well. And at the Louvre, the few paintings by Maria which were left, like the flea picker on the right, uh, uh, one of these large paintings taken from Seville, and the great Immaculate Conception, uh, which was sold at the Soult sale in the 1850s and then bought by the Louvre. So that Immaculate Conception here, bought in the 1850s from Marshall Soult's collection after his death, uh, was bought for for several million francs. It was. I think in absolute numbers, until the 1970s, the largest amount of money the Louvre had ever paid, paid for any work of art. So that shows you the esteem that the Spanish school was held, and it tells you how important the loss of the Gallery Espanol was for the French, and they had to compensate any way they could, so they were willing just to go to the mat and pay an enormous sum of money for the most prestigious painting so that they could um, in a sense, uh, restore their glory. Manet met Degas. They literally bumped into each other backwards uh, in front of that little infanta by Velasquez as they were both making etchings. Um, Manet, on the right, was making a drawing which he was going to transfer to his plate for an etching. And Degas, on the left, was drawing directly onto the copper plate. And Manet couldn't believe that Degas had the, um, the, the sureness, the deafness of touch, the confidence to work directly on, the, on, on, on copper. Degas, of course, was a great and facile draftsman. Manet was an awkward and, and rather deliberate uh, draftsman, a great, probably a greater painter than Degas, but not as good a draftsman. And so the two of them met while they were both copying this little Velasquez. And they had a great friendship and friendly rivalry for the rest of their lives. It was probably Degas that took 
Manet to see the painting on the top, um, thought to be by Velasquez in the Portales collection in Paris. It's now thought to be an Italian 17th century painting, but never mind. Everyone in the 19th century thought it was Velasquez. And you see it inspired Manet to make this extraordinary dead Toreador, uh, but now at the National Gallery of Washington. And finally, uh, sort of having derived as much information as he possibly could from the photographs, the books, the meager amount of uh, Spanish painting that was in France after the closing of the Galerie Espanol in 1848, Manet thought, I have got to go to Spain. And he finally does. And he is brought to his knees by the vision of Velazquez's paintings at the Prado. And he writes all of this in friends and said, they are so much more beautiful than I ever imagined. That Velazquez has to be the greatest painter of all time. He was also brought to his bed by Spanish cooking. And in fact, he had to cut his trip short by two weeks because he was so sick to his stomach. But he said that he was enormously refreshed and revived by the experience. He said, I discovered in Velazquez's work the fulfillment of my own ideals in painting. And the sight of those masterpieces gave me enormous hope and courage. And he wrote all of his friends, Baudelaire, Fontaine Latour, Degas, about the various paintings that he had seen. And when he came home, he continued to work in the genre, now with new strategies and tricks that he had picked up from the close observation of these Spanish paintings while he was there in Spain. We, would continue to, we will continue to see reverberations of Spanish painting in his work in the 1870s. And this is another um, actor, or here, uh, the great baritone of the Paris Opera, Jean-Baptiste Faure, again in the role of Hamlet. Uh, <clears throat> but now you see the light palette of his Impressionist period after Manet became friends with Monet uh, and uh, he began to adopt different color sensibility and to bring light into his pictures. But the experience of the Prado continued to resound in his work. So here is another beggar, this painting now at the Art Institute of Chicago on the right, based on the great Esopus by uh, Velazquez, still at the Prado on the left. And he clearly spoke uh, with great uh, ardor to his French compatriots about what he saw. And that, that I think, instilled an even greater interest in Spanish painting and prototypes to people like Edgar Degas. So here's just a little painting. It's a little Petit Rien uh, by Degas. But it shows him thinking about Spain. So a, a kind of uh, imaginary troubadour picture on the right, but clearly inspired by Velazquez's Meninas, which Degas only knew through photography and reproductions. But his beautiful portrait of James Jacques Tissot, his friend the painter, is clearly inspired by Velazquez's self-portrait in Las Meninas on the left. So you see uh, here a moment of interruption in the studio of the painter. And here you see in Degas' painting a moment of interruption where the, the, the artist here, surrounded by his own work, interrupted, pauses for a second, and looks at Degas, who paints his portrait. What I love about this uh, painting, which is the beautiful uh, portrait of Zola, who becomes a great defender of Manet's work in the press, uh, a, previously a good friend and childhood buddy of Paul Cezanne and Aix-en-Provence, is, and the painting is so beautiful here in Toledo, is that it shows uh, this, this, this key moment in the history of French painting where the baton is being handed, uh, is being taken from Spain and handed to Japan. So in this painting, you see Zola with a book uh, of uh, describing Spanish painting, and here a photograph of Goya's Maja Desnuda in the Prado, whose whose face has been altered to look adoringly uh, at uh, Emil Zola. And in the background, you see um, a 
print by Goya after Velazquez. So you have Goya and Velazquez, Goya again, but then here this Kuniyoshi, a, a Japanese uh, actor, this beautiful Japanese screen, and as Larry Nichols was uh, commenting earlier, the, the beginning of a painting, we can barely make out the frame in another painting up there. But here you see uh, the, the dual influence of Spain and Japan. We're right in 1867. The World's Fair has occurred. There's an enormous Japanese pavilion with lots of Japanese decorative arts, lacquerware screens, Japanese prints. And again, immediately you see uh, the reflection of that experience in, in, in painting. We see it here with some Japanese style painting in the portrait of Tissot. So you have Spain and Japan coexisting simultaneously now in the late 1860s. Degas, uh, when, when one starts looking with Spanish glasses at Degas' work, you see, it's amazing what you find. So the great Bellelli portrait, which was shown at the Salon of 1867, this is his aunt, Laura Bellelli, and her estranged husband in their house in Florence with these two beautiful girls. Well, isn't that girl just, just like the Meninas in uh, the Velazquez painting, Las Meninas? And is there not something about this painting that reminds you of this painting, the, the family of Charles IV of Spain um, by Goya, which he knew, again, from reproduction. And one begins, you know, this is a portrait of Degas' uh, sister, Therese, wearing a mantilla. Why is she wearing a mantilla? Because everything Spanish is fashionable in the 1860s in Paris. And that's why this woman is, is on a balcony with a mantilla, uh, fanning herself with a, a Spanish fan, as if she were one of Goya's machas. There's, it's simply about fashionability at this point. And of course, there's the great painting, The Balcony, by Edward uh, Manet. Why did he paint this picture? Well, he had seen no less than four different versions, only one of which is authentic, by Goya. Um, and we've got the authentic one here on the screen on the left. And this one he saw in Spain, and he had seen three others, including the, the, probably the more famous one, and now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, not by Goya whether Manet could distinguish between them, the various versions he saw, I don't know, but he was fascinated by the conceit of that painting, the idea that fashionable women and their, and their men would be uh, taking the air uh, prior to supper on a uh, warm Spanish uh, evening in, in Madrid. But these are uh, Parisians on a weekend holiday in the north of France with those bright green painted shutters but set out to be Spaniard. So it's clearly an homage to Spanish painting, if not painted in the style of. And we see reverberating through Manet and Degas circles all kinds of references to these balcony paintings, whether it's Ava Gonzalez on the left or Mary Cassatt on the right, or in Renoir's little, uh, beautiful little portrait uh, in, in Cleveland, um, Romain Lascaux, uh, you know, once you have your Spanish glasses on, then you see the prototypes that these artists are looking at. And it goes on from there. Who else was in the circle of Fontaine Latour and Edgar Degas and, Edgar, Edgar Degas and Edward Manet, but James Whistler on the, on the left and on the right, Sargent. Carolus Durand. And there's a portrait of Manet in your exhibition by Carolus Durand uh, looking at this wonderful Goya on the left. And Renoir at the end of his life, uh, thinking of Velazquez. And uh, sorry, it was Velazquez on the left and not, of course, a Goya. And as I mentioned, there were troops of Spanish dancers uh, coming through Spain and all the artists wanted to paint them. So here's Courbet's um, Adela Guerrero. Here is Edward Manet's Lola de Valence. Here's the beautiful Emilie Ombre in the role of Carmen in the opera, painted by Manet, which you have here in Toledo today. 
<clears throat> William Merritt Chase, John Singer Sargent. This was the famous Spanish dancer that came to New York. Her name was Carmen Sita. And so in our exhibition in 2003, we ended with this coda of Spanish-inspired paintings by American artists. And the reason I included these paintings in the exhibition called The French Taste for Spanish Painting, what's the role of Americans there? Because it seemed to me that this was the proof of the hypothesis. If the, hypo if the question is, um, did, was there a shift in the, in the paradigm of painting away from idealism to realism, away from high Renaissance painting to Baroque painting as a model, away from finished Florentine Renaissance surfaces, think Raphael, think Bronzino, to more elusive, suggestive, and optical style painting like Velazquez. If there was this shift from about 1850 to 1800 to about 1850, how can we prove it? We can prove it in the Americans, because the Americans growing up in Boston or Philadelphia or New York, not having great museums to look at, to learn from. After the Civil War, they get on a boat, they go to Europe, and for the first time, they're not going to Rome. They're going to Paris, and then from Paris, they go to Madrid. Why? Because they want to paint like Spaniards. So here are these Americans who have no truck with France, no truck with Italy, no truck with Spain. They have no reason to like Spanish painting over any other, other than it was then the fashion. So they were going in the 1870s and 1880s to France because that was the cradle of modernism. But as soon as they got there, they wanted to paint like Spaniards. And that, to me, is proof that there was this tremendous shift. And that, to me, is why Manet in the 1860s wanted to paint like Velasquez. Even though there were no longer any Spanish paintings in France, it was the memory of the Galerie Espagnole made possible only by the invasion of the Iberian Peninsula by, by Napoleon, the looting of all the great art in Seville and Madrid by Napoleon's army, putting into play and into motion all these great Spanish paintings, which are now all over the world, including here in Toledo, all thanks to these historical circumstances. And if there's one lesson that I hope you'll take home tonight after my talk is that it was the actual and immediate experience of genuine works of art that inspired these artists. It was seeing the work of art in General Soult's house, in the Grand Gallery of the Louvre, in the Gallery Espanol at the Louvre, at the Prado after 1819, that inspired these painters from Proudhon and Gerard and David all the way up to John Singer Sargent and William Merritt Chase. It was the actual sight of these paintings. And the great glory that we have, the opportunity that all of us living in the world today, although we can access almost anything on the internet, we still have wonderful museums like you have here in Toledo, where you too can be inspired by the actual works of art. Thank you very much.